stop, stop. Oh, you have. No. <laughs> uh, this is Stephen Fry. <laughs> Um, we are going to invent an alphabet, and I'm going to make some of it up, and Stephen's going to make some of it up, and we're going to need you to help us with some of the letters. But we're going to start with... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start with ambition, Stephen. What is it that you would most now like to do? Now, it's very hard to answer. Um, I... Uh... I, I have a theory that is very unpopular in America, that, um, that the worst thing you can ever be is goal-oriented. Um, in, in America, it is taken as a sacred truth that the first step towards self-fulfillment and success is to set yourself goals. Um, and, and I think that that is the most disastrous thing in life you can ever do, partly because if you miss your goals, you hate yourself and you feel a failure. And if you hit your goals, you are bound to be astonished by the fact that they don't bring any level of happiness. So you, you, it is, it's just looking in the wrong direction. So I don't, I'm not sure what I'm ambitious to be. If I said I was ambitious to be happy, that would sound very dull. Um, I, you know, is, there's no one I am ambitious to go to bed with. There's no one I'm ambitious to uh, meet necessarily. I, I'm, I'm, I, I suppose it's just what I'm ambitious for is not to turn into a, a bitter, angry old person. I'm now 52, and if there's anything in the world that upsets me, it is um, it's that kind of, I hate this, I hate that. that you know, when you see newspapers saying, why this is terrible, or people saying that something is crap, or, uh, and, um, and those programs like Grumpy Old Men, you know? I can't, I just... It's, it's just so easy. It's a lot of, I mean, it, people I like, Arthur Smith and Will Self, are bright and clever people, just pretending to be angry about things. That, and, and I would hope that as I got older, I got more and more accepting of everything, so that if, say, in 30 years' time, there's a modern equivalent of Lady Gaga, I want to think that I will say, tunes are so much better now than they ever were. All things are better than they ever were. They may not be, but they're almost certainly not worse. But something happens to you as you age that makes you convinced that they're worse. And I hate that something. I think it's deleterious to the human spirit to believe that your island of youth was somehow privileged and blessed as better, richer, more, more fulfilling, more artistic, more creative, more innocent. All of that is really a result of uh, sentimentality of the wrong kind, false memory syndrome, and, and a lack of historicity. Because if you look in history, people have always said that. They've always said it. And, and I think the best ambition anyone can ever have is to get younger as they get older, to be more accepting and to be less closed. That's what I would hope for. B is for boy. Oh, thank you very much. B is, for... B is for bored. What makes you bored? Oh, bored. I mean, you work at a higher speed than almost anybody I know. So what, what holds you up? Um, bored. I'm, I suppose it, it's very interesting being in the public eye. Um, it relates to ambition. If you'd said, what, what, what was I ambitious for when I was a teenager? I've recently had to accept that when I was between 17 and 25, if I'm honest, I was desperate to be famous. I really was. And I know now that we are all supposed to pay lip service to the idea that fame is an illusion, a snare, a terrible rainbow that people chase that will only get further away. It's not the substance of what it is you should be doing, that the, the modern culture of celebrity is a, is a terrible thing. But, nonetheless, when I was a teenager watching Parkinson, I, I wanted to jump into the television and be part of this glamorous world of extraordinary people. I, I fantasized about being stopped in shops and asked for an autograph. But what I did not fantasize about was a world that, and oh, how, how just it is that I should suffer from it, a world that I've welcomed, the digital world, has now means that unlike when I first did become quite well known, 
Everybody now has a camera. And if you want to know what bores me, <laughs> it is at a signing queue for a book, for example. Um, it used to be fun to be able to go, and what's your name, where are you from, without sounding like the Prince of Wales, which is a challenge. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but to fall into a, a conversation is really good fun. But now that's impossible, because the moment someone arrives at the queue, they're looking at the person next to me and going, would it be all right if I had a photograph? And it's not only that they have a camera, whether it's in the form of a phone or a digital camera, it's of course, they want to be in the picture. So they're giving it to someone else. And that person is like someone who has never seen a reptile being given a chameleon. <laughs> What? So, ugh, how do I, huh? Is this the, oh, oh, I've turned it off, I think. It's, it's, if I could have back the hours in which I have gone, oh, get on with it, for f sake, get on with it. If, if I had that back, I would be very happy. So that is when I am maximally bored, if maximally can be considered an adverb. Uh, Cambridge, what kind of... What kind of transfer was that for you? It, it was a very extraordinary thing for me, and um, what I'm about to say will sound about as poncy as you could ever be, um, but it, being this, as this is a literary festival, maybe it's allowable. When I was 17, I got arrested by the police, um, which I wrote about in my first autobiography, and, and I went to prison. And when I emerged, I emerged from a custodial sentence, as, as it were, a custodial period, with two years probation um, and my parents were understandably at the end of their tether and they, they were they'd been amazing uh, considering I'd run away from this and I'd been expelled from schools and um, and so when I arrived back home on, on, on probation I said I want to do some A-levels but I'd run away from so many schools and I'd done my O-levels when I was 14 because in those days you did um, if, you know, if you well, no, consider... most people did them at 16. So yeah, but I mean, just a lot no, I mean, if you could, I mean, yeah, all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, and so, but then I seriously kind of screwed up every other opportunity. So um, they said, well, if you, it's fine if you really want to, but it's up to you. That you know, they said we're, we're no longer going to do it. So I knew that Norwich City College, which is like a further education in, establishment in Norwich, did a one-year A-level course. So I. I I went, literally, the day I got back from Puckle Church, these were the extraordinary cast I managed to assemble. It's very, very difficult to cast the young because if they're young and well-known, the chances are they're just booked up because the, the system is greedy for young talent. And if they're young and unknown, it's hard to be sure whether the money people will be satisfied with them. And there, there were two important parts, and I'd been struggling and struggling to cast them. And... Uh, I'd cast Michael Sheen, whom I'd worked with in, in the film Wild. He'd played Robbie Ross, and I knew how good he was. And he played the sort of Brian Howard figure. But there were two parts, and I'd had t literally a day and two-thirds looking at young actors, some still at drama school, some just left. Or, uh, and then I had two in a row. One was, uh, they were both Scottish, and one came in and read, and it, he'd just done half a line. I thought, well, that's him. And I almost said, that's it, no, sorry, stop. Which I realized would make him think, oh God, I'm crap, I better go. Um, <laughs> it's the weird thing is the longer someone stays in an audition, the, 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 less, the less you actually like them. You're just trying to give them a chance to maybe change your mind. But when someone is perfect, you just know it straight away. And, and, and you, you just think, fine, go away, it's fine, it's all right. Because you're going to just be in touch with their agents and say you've got the part, which you're not allowed to do when you're there, of course. Um, anyway, this first Scott, he was so brilliant. He left, and I turned to the casting director who had, you know, compiled all these people for me. I said, he's, he's, he's going to be, where? what's his name, what's his name again? David Tennant. Right, David Tennant. So, you know, brilliant, brilliant. And then this, uh, this other one comes in, even younger, even more Scottish, if that makes any sense. Um, and even more brilliant, almost. I'm like, okay, this is, I'm, either I am just hallucinating because I've been here for two days and I'm so desperate, but, or this guy is brilliant. 
So again, I just want to say, shut up, you've got the part. But I, I let him speak. I said, thanks, great. Press. And what was his name? James what, McAvoy, right? So I remember James McAvoy. And, and, and that's the kind of fortune you have. And to, to have had all the other, to have Peter O'Toole and um, Stephen Campbell Moore and, and, and Emily Mortimer and, uh, uh, and, and Fenella Woolgar. I mean, it was just an extraordinary cast. Uh, and I was really, really lucky to have that. Um, well, I, I took them all. There's a... It's so the thing about the English, um, this could cover you, as in you and non-you. Remember the famous, um, the famous noblesse oblige that, uh, that Nancy Mitford compiled in which the you and non-you was posited. In other words, that these days, class is not indicated by money, but simply by vocabulary, not even by accent. It, and, and that's where you and non-you arose in the 50s. Um, but I was interested in accent too. I, you know, we all know that, as it were, it's you to say napkin and non-you to say serviette and all that sort of thing. But um, I was interested in accent and I, I had this knowledge, but I didn't know how to impart it to the actors without sounding like a snob myself, that the accent they were mostly doing, which was a sort of Celia Johnson accent, was middle class. You know that, oh, oh Freddie, oh gosh, you know that. It sounds upper class to us now, but that accent, that brief encounter accent, is absolutely middle class. And the aristocrats didn't sound like that. And I'd heard them and I tried to, and I thought, well, what, I'll, go to, I'll go to the source. The, by this time, Diana Mitford, to whom Vile Bodies incidentally was dedicated under the name of Brian, Guin Mrs. Brian Guinness, but she then married Oswald Mosley, and so she was now Diana Mosley. But she had just died, but her, the younger sister, the Duchess of Devonshire, the famous Debo, was still alive, so I, knowing her slightly, called her up and said, could I bring around a fleet of actors and ask you to tell, tell them how society people spoke in, 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 as they'd say in America, back in the day? She said, oh, I'd be delighted. She said. So I took them all around. She felt great, particularly for James, she felt, isn't he lovely? Um, and she said, well, I've been thinking about it. You have to forget, it's all nonsense now. She said, my grandson says toilet. I said, what, the future Duke of Devonshire says toilet? I, oh, no, it's nothing sacred. But um, she, she said, I think I can best describe how we spoke by saying that the middle classes, if they had to give an, a sort of a, a, an ejection of, of su surprise, would go, oh. Whereas we would give it at least two syllables. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So that was her tip. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that generosity of vowel. Yeah. Um, Wagner, ooh, Wagner, go on. No, no, no. no. Wagner. Oh. I was a Wales War, Woodhouse. You're right, Wagner. Yes, I do have a lot of W's in my life with Woodhouse and, and War and Wild. Uh, and Richard Wagner, who I recently not got out of my system, but it's a strange thing growing up as a, someone with Jewish blood in you, um, finding that the music and drama of Richard Wagner has an extraordinary effect on you, one that you think of as a force for good, you know, that this is great art, truly, truly great and extraordinary art, and yet knowing that he himself was such a monster, and that he inspired such monsters, principally the Hitler we've already discussed, and so he's not to everyone's taste, I mean, not aside from his own unpleasantness, um, and aside from the connection with Nazism about which one could talk forever, um, there is simply the length of his works. I mean, the Ring Cycle is four operas, not that he called them operas, but let's call them operas just for the sake of convenience, uh, of which you have to see over a week, you know, so you see, you see Das Rheingold, the first one on Monday, that's an average length opera, it's about three and a half hours usually, something like that. Then on Tuesday you see Die Valkyrie, which is Eh, it's four and a half hours. Like then you get Wednesday off. Well, it's not you that's getting Wednesday off, it's the singers that are getting Wednesday off. Then th Thursday you get Siegfried, the, 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 the third one. Um, and now you're going into the theatre about three o'clock in the afternoon in order to come out at a reasonable time, like half past ten. Um, so then you get Friday off, and then you get the biggie, then you get Goethe Demerung. And, and that's huge. I mean, it's in three acts, like all of them. Um, the first act is longer than the whole of Tosca. I mean, that's, this is what you're talking about. Meisterzinger is, is, is longer than, than even than Goethe Demerol. So these are massive works, and it is easy to see why the, all the jokes go, you know, it's got marvellous moments, but terrible half hours, and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, but it, once it enters your soul, it's very hard for it not to be there. And 
even if one was to say one despised it, it it's the enormousness and the enormity, if you like, of, of his legacy. Um, one of the nicest things that ever happened to me, as far as Wagner is concerned, is years and years ago, I wrote for the Listener magazine, a regular column. Uh, the Listener is long defunct, of course. But, and I happened to write a review of a book by Brian McGee called Aspects of Wagner, which is still one of the best books written on Wagner. A very, very short book, oddly enough. And um, a week and a half later, I got a letter. It said, All Souls College, Oxford. Dear Mr. Fry, I read with interest your views on Wagner your views as a Jew on Wagner, your views as a non-religious Jew on Wagner, your views as a Wagnerite on Wagner, your views as a Wagnerite on Jews. And he wrote like, very funny, extra elegant letter. Perhaps a lunch would not disgust you. I have a club in London called the Garrick. Maybe we could meet there. Yours, etc. Isaiah Berlin. God. So I thought I'd do anything. I'd walk 10 miles over broken glass with no shoes to, to meet Berlin. So, of course, I said yes, and, 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 and we met. And he loved Wagner, too, but also, of course, had the gravest doubts about it. And, um, but he said, um, he said, you know, you, he had a very guttural voice, which I won't try and repeat. Bill <laughs> always sounded as if he, he, he was about to choke. But he said, um, if, if a genius, he said, there are ways people define genius, and it's an, not really a very useful word, but there ought to be a word, and it may as well be genius, that describes someone who, whatever their field may be, when they leave it, it is different. Nothing is the same because they lived in that field. They changed the way things were done. And in those terms, Wagner was the greatest genius in art there ever was. There is something so extraordinary about the emotions unleashed in his music. Once you enter it, I understand how you see you know, dragons and goddesses. It's like bloody Tolkien. I don't want that. Well, I can fully understand that. I happen not to be a fan of Tolkien particularly. Um, and, and it's certainly nothing to do with dragons and goddesses that makes me love it. It's about, it's so hugely emotional and it's about love and redemption. And, and it's so beautiful and astounding and explosive. Um, Anyway, I can, I, I can tell.